well. I just wish I could have taken pictures. Um, so anyway, when you burn up all that kinetic energy in, in heat, uh, you slow down to a few hundred miles an hour, you deploy the main parachute. Uh, that, that's basically how you land. Uh, interesting thing, if you look back, uh, this thing, it looks like a lump, but it actually has some lift. Right, it's not a zero. Uh, the lift to drag ratio is 0 0.3, which so, you know, isn't a lot, but it, it, it's not zero. And one of the interesting things is that this has a, a conical shape, and there's an axis of symmetry along here. And when we come down, with the packing is very careful. I mean, it, it's like every uh, every hundred grams is very carefully packed. The reason for that is the center of mass is not on the axis of symmetry, and that's very deliberate. The reason for that is if you roll <coughs> the capsule this way, uh, you change the center of mass and you can affect whether it lands here or there. It's like you can have some fine tuning of about up to 50 miles uh, of where the landing site is. So that was uh, you know, another part of the unique aspect of it. So here, you're just coming down, you know, wherever you land, you land. Um, again, you can see how wide open Kazakhstan is. This is about three feet off the ground, and we have retro rockets uh, underneath, which are controlled by uh, radioactive materials. Now, what's more reliable than something radioactive? There's a, uh, there's a radiation detector on the bottom, and you know, so when the reflected intensity gets enough, it sets off the uh, retro rockets, and, and that's how we land. Um, our landing was actually, you know, quite smooth. <coughs> this is a picture of me when uh, they just pulled me out of the capsule. Um, we were only five miles off our intended landing site, and within two minutes, I could hear helicopter blades. And, you know, I knew they would find us. Uh, here's the crew that we landed with. John Phillips is on the left. The guy changing toilets. Sergei Krikalov eating food in the middle, and I'm on the right. You see two Russian doctors there. When you get back into a weightless environment, you, you're really kind of dizzy. Because again, it's playing games with your vestibular system. Now it has this uh, gravity orientation, which is, it hasn't had in uh, 10 days. In my case, six months for these guys. So um, even though I was able to walk off, I, I had a person on each arm just in case I tripped and fell. I was also one inch taller. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't have gravity pushing down on your vertebrae, so they, they extend a little bit. But you lose it in about a day, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> see, they discussed the factor about you being younger or an age differentiation. As to, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll tell you one thing, space is not a young man's game or a young woman's game either. Um, the youngest one I knew of, there was a Russian cosmonaut who was 27. But I would say the usual age is 35 to 55, and probably more likely over 40. I mean, look at our crew. I was 60, MacArthur's 54, and Tucker at 53. They think what they call the space cowboys. Um, just think of, here's what you got. Here's a typical astronaut or cosmonaut. Advanced technical degree, a military pilot, that already advanced technical degree puts you 25, 26. Become a pilot in the military, 29, 30. See, so you're 30 years old before you even, you know, go into the space program. So, uh, and then just many years of training. So, you know, uh, I met a lot of astronauts <coughs> in training. I, I, I can't remember anyone in their 20s. But you know whether age affects that, I, I just don't know like the answer. If you went you know, to Australia, there's a day in your life that's missing. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's a day no. in your life that's missing. Oh, but that's that's a, an artifact. And I'm wondering if there's any correlation between the no. time spent out in space and the time on Earth. And the, oh, <laughs> one of the questions, you know, I, I did some ham radio sessions. Well, do they have a ham <laughs> station? Uh, station. And, uh, you know, sometimes they send you the questions in advance. This one kid asked me about relativity. Right? I was impressed for a high school student to know this. He said, uh, how much younger are you going to be when you come down? So fortunately, I had the time. I could scribble on the envelope and, and you know, one minus.
this view of a C squared. And uh, it turns out I'm about a little over a microsecond younger. <laughs> at 17,000 miles an hour, I mean, it's almost nothing. The other guys, I, I, if I remember, were a few milliseconds younger. But you really, you'd have to spend an awful lot of time in space or get going at much higher velocities for it to pay off. So, you know, close up, would I do it again? I had a wonderful time. I loved it. I would, I'd do it again. I, I, I'd go right now if, if they take me. The thing that impressed me the most was just you know how how small Earth is and how you know when you see the sun come up, there's just the atmosphere is a thin band that reminded me of a the shell on a hard boiled egg. And you know what impressed me was that there isn't much air out there uh, left. And you know the thing I learned was what I told you in the beginning, this thing about not giving up. Um, I was supposed to fly in October of 2004. I was in training for two months, routine medical exam, and a dark spot shows up on a lung x-ray, out, disqualified. And you know, this was a devastating experience for me because I had all these high hopes of going up in space. I go back to the United States and everybody's saying, hey, Greg, we thought you were flying. What happened? And I have to tell the same story over and over again. And, you know, it, it's, I'm sure most of you have had something in your life that was just really devastating. I wasn't a fun guy to be around for about a year, but um, you know, I didn't give up. It, the spot went away by itself. It was harmless. Uh, even now, the doctors don't know what what it was. But even after three months, when the spot went away, the Russian doctors still said no, mm. couldn't go in. Um, and for nine months, I worked with my own crew and sent them, you know, lab tests, and results. No, no, no. It kept going. Finally, after nine months, it was exactly a year ago almost, they said, all right, we'll let you back in the program. And that wouldn't have had all the money in the world couldn't have made that happen. The only thing that made it happen was I didn't give up. I mean, just stuck it through. Even though, I mean, I, a year and a half ago, I never thought I'd fly, but I, I just hung in there and, and made it happen. So I guess in a nutshell, you know, what I learned is something I'll pass on to you and it's worked all my life is just don't give up. Thanks very much. I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, further that you have or let you get on with your meeting if there's something that you have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, the batteries. <laughs> 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 <laughs>